Hello, so this is physics A levels May June 2019 variant 13 and the physics code is 9702. So let's start question number one. Question number one says that what is an SI base unit? Among them, current is a drive unit because I equals Q or T. Drum is mass. It's kg. It's not an SI unit. Kelvin C. Kelvin is temperature. This is an SI base unit. So it's C. Question number two. It says that osmium, a naturally occurring element, has a density of 23,000 kg per meter cube. What is also a value of the density of osmium? You have to just find an equivalent density of osmium that's 23,000 kg per meter cube. So we have, you can see over here that it, we have a uh, kg per centimeter cube so what you can do is you can convert this into centimeter cube 23,000 kg per meter cube you just have to do is convert the meter cube into centimeter cube multiply the meter cube by 10 to the power 6 this will become kg per centimeter cube which is 2.3 into 10 to the power negative 2 so this becomes d question number 3 says that two lugs are doing an oil rig as shown the tensions in the towing cables are 5 kN and 5 4 kN and 5 kN what is the total force acting on the rig due to the cables in the direction to the east so you just have to find the direction in the east which is the horizontal direction the sum of horizontal directions which for 4 k kN it's cos 4 k cos 20 plus 5 k cause 50 so just add them up you will get the answer 7 kilometers let's see question number 4 says what is the approximate kinetic energy of an olympic athlete when running at maximum speed during a 100 meter race you just have to know that mass of an average athlete is about 70 kg and um, top speed maximum speed might be like 10 meters per second though Ossian Bowl's speed is more but that's a good average my maximum speed so considering the kinetic energy it's mix up to 4000 joules let's be just approximate the values of mass and uh, mass and velocity question 5 says that the diagram shows the reading on an analog ammeter which digital ammeter reading is the same as the reading on the analog ammeter so here we can see that we have 1.6 milliamperes so it's 1.6 milliamperes which is equal to about 1600 micro amperes just convert this milli into micro multiply it by 10 to the power 3 we will get 1600 so it's 1600 micro amperes it's a straightforward question. Question number six. A micrometer screw gauge is used to determine the diameter of a small uniform steel sphere. The micrometer reading is 5 millimeter plus minus 0 0.01 millimeter. What will be the percentage uncertainty in the calculation of the volume of the sphere using these values? You know the uncertainty that's 0 0.01 you know the actual value that's 5 we just multiply it by 100 and because it's a volume so it's r cube okay so it would be the 3 would be multiplied with it because the power comes in front of the uncertainty so it's 0 0.01 divided by 5 into 100 into 3 into 3 is because of the cube volume it's 0.6 percent c is the answer question number seven says that the graph shows the variation of velocity with time t for an object if the object 
passes a fixed point at time t is equal to 0 what is the displacement of the object from the fixed point at time t is equal to 5 seconds and what is the acceleration of the that's the velocity time graph for the displacement you have to find the distance uh, area under this graph so the area is the area of this trapezium it's half into 5 which is its height or the this thing I call this the height because it's and the sum of parallel sides that's 4 plus 24 it's 70 and the acceleration is the gradient velocity time the gradient of the velocity time graph and so just calculate it 24 minus 4 is changed in y and 5 is changed in x 5 minus 0 so it's 24 minus 4 5 minus 0 it's 4 so it's b displacement 70 and acceleration is 4 question number 8 says that a skydiver jumps from an aeroplane and falls vertically through the air which graph shows the radiation with time t of the skydiver's driver's vertical velocity so he is falling he, fa he falls from an aeroplane and vertically through the air the downwards there comes a moment when the velocity becomes terminal velocity because the upward force and the downward force equal themselves so at that point you can say that the velocity time graph would be something like that see it can't be linear because air resistance is not said to be ignored so it has to be considered so let's see question number nine it says a nuclide a nucleus collides with a stationary nucleus in a vacuum. The diagram shows the path of the nuclei before and after the collision. No other particles are involved in the collision. Which diagram is not possible? We just see that before the collision, the momentum is just horizontal. So after the collision, the momentum, the horizontal momentum must be there, but the vertical momentum must cancel out. So, two vertical momentum to cancel out, vertical momentum have to be in upward direction and the other one has to be in the downward direction so that they cancel to zero. Okay, so in part A, that it says that which diagram is not possible. In A, they are cancelling out. You see, this component is going upward and from this component, the vertical component going downward, so they are cancelling. So in B, so in D, they are cancelling out. In C it is not. They are this is also going downwards and this vertical component is also going downwards. So they are not cancelling out. So C is not possible. Question number 10. It says that a uniform electric field is created by two parallel vertical plates. A positively charged plate particle is in the vacuum between the plates as shown. Which statement is correct? The electric field makes the particle move towards an active plate with a constant speed, the electric field makes the particle move towards an active plate with a constant acceleration, the electric plate produces a uniform rate of decrease in the particle acceleration, the electric field produces a uniform rate of increase in the particle acceleration. Now you have to realize that in a uniform electric field acceleration is constant. So <coughs> if Acceleration is constant, so C and D, the option C and D will eliminate, which implies that velocity is changing. Okay, so A, it says that the velocity is constant. This also cancels out, so the rest option is B. So B is the correct option, that the electric field makes the particle move towards the negative plate with a constant acceleration. It's an a negative positively charged particles would have to move towards the negative plate okay. question number 11 says a picture is suspended from a nail by a single cord connection to a two point x and y on the picture there is negligible friction between the cord and the nail so that the tension in both sides of the cord is the same the picture hangs symmetrically as shown the tension in the cord is t the angle between the cord and the vertical is theta on both sides which statement is correct a it says that increasing the length of the cord with point x and y in the same place 
is in the same place on the picture would reduce the tension in the cord. Moving points x and y further apart on the picture while keeping the length of the cord constant would reduce the tension in the cord. Moving points x and y to the top edge of the picture while keeping their distance apart constant and length of the cord constant would reduce the tension in the cord and the weight of the picture is equal to t cos theta. <coughs> so you have to see that first consider d. <coughs> d is the weight of the picture is equal to t cos theta. Weight is a vertical force which you know that this is t and this is t. So it's t cos theta and this is also t cos theta. So it's 2t cos theta. So weight would be equal to 2t cos theta. It's not t cos theta. D is not a possibility. For B, it says that further moving points x and y further apart while keeping the length of the cord constant <coughs> would reduce the tension. It would not reduce, it would in fact increase the tension because the cord is the same and you are moving the points x and y further apart. A it says increasing the length of the cord with point x and y would reduce the tension. That's correct because you are reducing the length of the cord. So the same force could be compensated and the tension in the cord would reduce per length. Okay, so you can say it like that that you have a small string and you have a bigger string. A bigger string have more potential to bear have a more potential to bear tension. A smaller string would have more less potential to bear tension. So if you if you if you increase the tension length of the string, you can increase the bearing capacity and decrease the tension in the cord. Question number twelve. That's a very, very good question. That's you can consider the question for an A star student. It says that a shop sign weighing 75 Newton hangs from a frame attached to a vertical wall. The frame consists of a horizontal rod XY and a rod XZ that is at an angle 30 degree to the horizontal rod XY is attached to the wall by a hinge X and has length 0.5 meters. Assume the weights of the rods are negligible. So, the weights of the rods are negligible so they do not have a center weight this rod has do not have a center weight this rod does not have a center weight what is the horizontal force exerted by the wall on rod x y you have to find the force which is exerted by this hinge over here if i can make it it's just like this force we are being asked to calculate this force so now, coming to the solution of this question, you should remember that clockwise moment is equal to the anti-clockwise moment. And the perpendicular distance in moment is considered. For example, this is the force acting downwards. So this is the pivot x we are considering it x the pivot so this force is acting in this direction and the distance which is being considered is the perpendicular distance so this is 90 degree this is 90 degree okay so this is causing the this uh you can say the rod to move clockwise so what's causing it to move anti-clockwise? That's a distension. This tension is moving into is making it to move anti-clockwise. So if it's the anti-clockwise tension T, then the perpendicular distance is this shortest distance from X. So just calculate this distance first. How can we calculate this distance? This is 90 degrees, this is a right angle triangle. This is the hypotenuse is 0.5. You know it's 30 degree. Just calculate this distance. The sine 30 equals x. Call this O. X O divided by 0.5. X O becomes 0.25. So this length becomes 0.25. The shortest distance. So this is the tension and this is the distance. 
So now the question comes: Why are we not considering this tension? Because we are not considering this tension in this rod because it's passing through the hinge. So when the forces pass through the hinge, they do not have any perpendicular distance. So the force is nullified. Okay. So this tension, the weight, the sine weight, and the tension in this string will be considered. So just apply simple that 75 into 0.5. Equals this T into this perpendicular distance, which is 0.25. So find the T. <coughs> this T is 150 newtons. Now we have to find the weight, the force exerted by the wall on the rod x y. So this is the horizontal force. So we have we have found this T, which is 150 newton. Just find this tension. How much will be this tension? This will be T. Cos 30, which is 150. Cos 30, which is 130 newton. So C is the answer. <coughs> Excuse me. Question number 13. What is the torque of the couple shown? Just find the torque. This is 15. And this is 5. Convert the centimeter into meter, and it's 0.75 newton. Question number 14, it says that, I think I should zoom it for you, because it's a bit. Water has a density of 1 gram per centimeter cube, less student has a density of 1.3 gram per centimeter cube, a student measures out a volume of 40 centimeter cube of less student into a container, the student adds water to the container to make a mixture of water and less student, assume that the total volume of the water and less student does not change when the two liquids are mixed, which volume of the water needs to be added to make a mixture of density 1.1 gram per centimeter cube. So we are given with the density of water which is 1, density of glycerine which is 1.3, volume of water which is 40 and the mixture volume which is 40. Okay, so the density of water plus glycerine equals to mixture water plus glycerine divided by volume mass that's mass that's sorry that's mass mass of water so density equals mass water plus glycerine divided by volume of water plus glycerine so the density is 1.1 the mass <coughs> is 40 40 for what uh, the mass is 40 plus 1.3 into volume of glycerine. So density into volume. That's density of glycerine into volume of glycerine. So volume of glycerine is unknown. So you can see that we have what we have done. We have just the this is the mass. So mass is density into volume divided by 40 plus volume of glycerine. So the unknown over here is volume of glycerine. Just find volume of glycerine from this equation, which is 80 centimeter cube. So the answer is P. Which statement about the principle of conservation of energy is correct? Energy conservation helps to conserve energy conserve energy sources. Not that's wrong. Energy is conserved only in system with efficiency of 100 percent. No. The supply of energy is limited, so energy should be conserved. No, the total amount of energy is in a closed system is constant. That's good. That's B. <coughs> Question number 16. It says that a student can run or walk up the stairs to her classroom. Which statement describes the power required and the gravitational potential energy gained while just running up the stairs compared to walking up them? So, here we have to know if a person is running upstairs, how would his uh, gravitational potential energy and his power change? So, if a person, if a particle m moves from this point to this point, his gravitational potential energy, no matter in whatever time he walks, it would be mgh. m, g, and h are, do not depend upon walking or running. Okay, so either you run or walk, your potential energy is independent of that, so it will not change. 
what about power what is power defining power is that power is energy supplied per unit time so per unit time okay so if you run like if you run or walk if you run you consume 50 joules if you walk you consume 50 joules okay so if you run it will take about five seconds to move from this to this point and if you walk let's say that it takes you 10 seconds more than running so for r running the power becomes energy supplied in energy over time and energy over time for walk so it, for run it becomes 10 watt for walk it becomes 5 watt simple as that so for walking you would require less power and for running you would require more power so c is that running provides the same rotation energy and uses more power so c the rest are not you just have to realize these things because number 17 says a lead pellet is shot vertically upwards into a clay block that is stationary at the moment of impact but is able to rise freely after impact the moment the mass of the pallet is 5 grams and the mass of the clay block is 95 grams. The pallet hits the block with an initial velocity, vertical velocity of 200 meters per second. It embeds itself into the block and does not emerge. How high does its initial position will the block rise? So it's basically asking you for the height with, it, with which it will rise. So you have to just know that initially what was the momentum initially the momentum was <coughs> of only of the lead pellet because the stationary clay was stationary so lead pellet was uh, 5 grams and 200 meters per second it was moving so it's 1000 grams meter per second that's the momentum so after collision what is the case after collision it's 100 which is the mass now because they have combined with each other embedded into each other so 100 uh, 95 plus 5 is 100 grams into the velocity we do not know the velocity equals the total momentum which is 1000 so v of the combined mass becomes 10 meters per second so you know the mass okay so what you can do is you can evaluate the kinetic energy which is half mv squared you know mass is 100 grams and v is 10 meter per second and from there you can equate it to the potential energy which is mgh mass is 100 g is 9.8 and h is the height it will rise so just equate it them equate them and get the height which is 5.1 meter that's simple on the surface of the planet, 30 joules of work is done against gravity to raise a mass of 1 kg through a height of 10 meter. How much work must be done to raise a mass of 4 kg through a height of 5 meters on this planet? So, from the first case, we can find the gravitational potential energy because work done is given, mass is given, and height is given. So, W equals to mgh, find the gravity which is 3 meters per second square. Gravitational point. So, in work 2, how much work is done we can find mgh m is 4 kg g is 3 from the previous case and h is 5 feet so 60 joules so b is the answer question number 19 <coughs> it says that four solid steel rods each of length 2 meter and cross-sectional area 250 millimeter square equally support an object weighing 10 kilo newton the weight of the object causes the rod to contract by 0.1 millimeter. The rods obey Hooke's law. What is the young modulus of this? Thing? So you have to know that an object, four steel rods, and an object of 10 kilo newton is being laid on them. So the rods contract. Okay. So if this whole weight is 10 kilo newton and there are four rods, so the weight will be equally distributed on the rods okay so if the weight equally distributes on the rod and there are four rods so the weight on each rod is 10 by 4 which is 2.5 kilometer so young modulus is stress over strain so we know the stress stress is force over area we know the force which is 2.5 k we know the area which is 250 this becomes 10 so for strain 
it's extension over length. Extension we know it's 0.1 and length we know it's 2000. So this becomes 5 into 10 to the power negative 5. So just plug in the value for the young model stress over strain. This becomes 2 into 10 to the power 11 meter per meter squared. Convert this millimeter into meter before finding the answer because it's in meter. It's B. <coughs> A wire is attached at one end to a fixed point a tensile force is applied to the other end of the wire causing it to extend. This is shown on the graph by the line OSP. The force F is then gradually reduced to zero and the wire contracts. This is shown on the graph by the line PQ. Which area on the graph represents the work done by the wire as it contracts? This was the time when it was stretching and when it contracts this is the line. So the area under this line will show the work done by the wire as it contracts. So this becomes Q P R Q. So it's C. Question number 21. It says that the graph shows the radiation of the displacement y with distance x along a progressive wave at one instant in time. What is the phase difference between P and Q on the wave? This is P and this is Q. So <coughs> If you are at this point, this is P, this is the reference point. Consider P, starting from P, this forms a complete wavelength. So this must be 360 degrees and halfway between its 180 degrees. Okay, so this is 360, complete wave. So 360, again a half wave is 180. So 360 plus 180 is 540. So from P, we have over here, it's 540 degrees. So 21C, a wave power generator takes advantage of the energy that is transferred by the motion of the wave across the surface of the oceans. The energy of the wave depends on its amplitude. What is the correct definition of the amplitude? The average amount of energy possessed by a wave? No. The difference in displacement between peak and trough? No. The maximum displacement on a point on the wave from equilibrium? Yes. Because this is equilibrium point. And the displacement, the maximum displacement is called the, the maximum displacement is called the amplitude. So let's see. The number of oscillations? No, that's related to time period and frequency. That's not. Schumer 23 says that a sound wave of frequency to 70 hertz is recorded by a CRO. The waveform on the CRO is shown. What is the time resetting of the CRO? So you can see that the time period is 3.7 milliseconds because we know the frequency is to sound. Okay, so just see this one, two, three, and you just have to know that just consider uh, for com that's a complete wavelength and that's a half wavelength. You have to find an appropriate visible good centimeters. So that's a good place to, to measure. So complete wavelength and a half wavelength. That's 1.5 wavelengths. So that's one, two, three, four, five, and five point five. Okay. So let's approximately here. That's approximately how so it becomes 5.5 divided by 1.5. So this will give us the wavelength, the comp uh, wavelength for one period is 3.66 centimeters. So time by setting is time period divided by the length in centimeters. So 3.7 divided by 3.66, which becomes one millisecond per centimeter. So it's B. Question number 24 says a motorboat vibrates in the water so that it produces water waves of frequency 0.2. That's the source frequency. The speed of this wave in the water is 20 meters per second. That's the observer frequency. The motorboat moves with a speed of 5 meters per second. That's the source, that's the source velocity. The total effect equation for sound wave also apply for wave water wave. What is the frequency with which the <coughs> waves hit the stationary sailing boat? That's we are asked to find the observer frequency. 
just plug in the formula which is given in the formula sheet in star of this paper observer frequency equals source frequency into observer frequency divided by observer velocity minus source velocity which is 0.27 hertz 25 says that infrared laser light is used for transmission of data along optic fibers what is the typical wavelength of infrared radiation you should know the wavelengths that's a recall question it's a question number 26 says that an elastic string is attached to an oscillator at one end and clamped at the other end so that the string is horizontal and in tension the oscillator is made to oscillate vertically the frequency of the oscillation is gradually increased from zero until the stationary wave is set up on the string the frequency is then increased further to frequency f when a second stationary wave is set up in the string the frequency is then increased further at which frequency does a third stationary wave occur so you have to know it's given over here that when a second in frequency f is observed when he sees that it's a second the frequency is then increased further to frequency f then a second stationary wave is set up so in the second stationary wave the, in the first stationary wave and uh, this the second stationary wave so at this point he says it's f so this length is lambda so l equals lambda which for which the frequency is f so v is equals to f lambda so f equals v over lambda so now it's at what which frequency does a third stationary wave occur so at third it we must know that it's a complete lambda and that's a half lambda so the three by two 1.5 lambda so just convert l is 1.5 lambda so lambda becomes 2 by 3 l so just plug in the values f equals v over lambda so v over lambda lambda is 2 by 3 l so this becomes 3 l v by 2 which is 1.5 times of the previous f so it's 1.5 f which b in an experiment water waves in a ripple tank are incident on a gap as shown some diffraction of the water wave is observed which changes to the experiment would provide a better demonstration of diffraction so for this thing you must know that this separation must ideally be equal to the wavelength of the wave for best diffraction so increase the wavelength of the waves if you increase the wavelength it would be comparable to this gap so it should give you good diffraction. Question number 28 says that a light of wavelength lambda is emitted from two point sources R and S and falls onto a distinct the distance stream at point P on the stream the light intensity is zero. What could explain the zero density at P? We have a Z0 intensity <coughs> that means that over here we have an up wave plus a down wave so they cancel out okay and they are equal in amplitudes so in this case light from the two sources is emitted in phase it was emitted in phase and the path difference is lambda by 2 so lambda by 2 says that it was a it was a destructive interference okay so it's half lambda by 2 so d is the answer question number 29 says that an apparatus is arranged to show double slit inter interference in a mon monochromatic light the slit separation is 0.1 millimeter the distance from the double slit to the screen with interference pattern is observed with 2.4 and the fin width is 12 millimeter the distance to the screen is now changed to 1.8 meter and the slit separation is double what is the new frame rate we simply have to calculate the lambda from the previous case which is axyd <coughs> equals 0.5 so from here we can find x which is change x 0.5 into 1.8 by 0.2 this becomes 4.5 so that's it uh, for this recording let's do it with a new video please do not forget to like this video and subscribe my channel and propagate 
my videos as much as you can. Thank you.